how you first became interested in gerontology? Um, I grew up in a three-generation family with a very much uh, beloved grandfather. He was my uh, mother's father. Uh, and he was uh, very, very close to me. Uh, my mother was an only child, and of the three siblings, of the three children, I was the only girl. I had two brothers. So I think I was a repeat of his parenting experience, and our personalities were very much alike. So I spent an awful lot of time with him um, from the time I was in elementary school. Uh, I, I was always sort of struck by how people like in the second or third grade would say nasty, you know, very negative things about older people, that they were crappy and they smelled bad and all of that. Um, and I didn't feel that way at all about my grandfather. So I think I started wondering why, um, you know, people had such negative attitudes towards older, but my, you know, the children around me had such negative attitudes about older people in my my attitudes were incredibly positive because I spent so much time with my grandfather. So that got me interested in that question. Um, and then by the time I was in high school, I was um, uh, getting interested in anthropology, which is my discipline. Uh, and I kind of you know, wove anthropology uh, in with my interest in, uh, in gerontology and older people. So ultimately, I became very interested in um, how people age cross-culturally. Um, and then when I went to college, I was majoring in anthropology. I spent my junior year abroad studying at Waseda University in Tokyo. And I lived with a Japanese family, and I went off very, very interested, uh, you know, in looking at or ma making note of how people grew old in Japan. Uh, and so I was, you know, getting, again, weaving those interests um, together. Um, when I graduated from college, I went on to initially a master's program in East Asian Studies with a Japan focus. Um, and then uh, I decided to go back into, to get my PhD in anthropology. Um, and my intention was to study uh, aging. At that point, I'd done so much stuff with Japanese that I was interested in looking at a society that um, took care of its older people in a way that was very different from what the Japanese were doing then, which was very heavily on family care of elders, uh, although that's changed dramatically now in Japan. Um, I've always been interested in Scandinavia, so for my dissertation research, I decided to go to Denmark because I had uh, contact with uh, someone I knew who was Danish. And so I did my dissertation research on aging in Denmark. Uh, and so that's how I you know, sort of began to weave those things together. And then got my PhD really having done research and uh, um, coming out with knowledge of aging in more than one culture. Basically. And so you've already alluded to it, but if you could expand on your career trajectory as a gerontologist from that point. Um, I, when I got my PhD in anthropology, I knew that I wanted to, um, you know, I was an anthropology of aging specialist. But I wanted to go into, you know, I wanted to also get credentialing in gerontology. So the first thing I did was I did a uh, postdoc uh, total fellowship at the um, University of Michigan Ann Arbor in interdisciplinary gerontology. So to really get good training, um, and I was there for a year and a half, uh, and then I had this opportunity um, to also to go to uh, do an additional postdoc of one year at UC San Francisco. And I was very interested. They have a medical anthropology program, and the postdoc was in um, social cultural gerontology, also sort of combining with medical anthro, because I already knew some people there. So I went there and I, I did that uh, for a year. Um, so I was really getting training, you know, sort of in not only getting credentialing in interdisciplinary gerontology, but also, you know, weaving it back into anthropology and particularly medical anthropology. Um, I was supposed to be in um, San Francisco for just one year. Um, the second semester in my postdoc uh, at UC San Francisco, they were looking for someone um, to uh, sit in, because we didn't take classes for credit, but we sat in on classes. Mm -hmm. They had an interdisciplinary uh, class uh, on you know, dementia, Alzheimer's and dementia that was being taught through the UC San Francisco's Memory Clinic and Alzheimer's Center. So they wanted one of the postdocs to um, audit this class. 
Um, and so I had not been that interested specifically in dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, and so I was thinking, well, I don't know whether that's one of my areas of interest in dermatology or not. And they were saying, well, we need someone from the postdoc program, so we should sit in that. So it was one of the, it really, it was a case of being in the right place at the right time because I joined this interdisciplinary class. And they had, UC San Francisco is a health sciences campus. So that they had people from all kinds, of like, you know, nursing and, and dentistry and so on. They had a, a multidisciplinary class. And one of the assignments that we were supposed to do, and, and again, if you audit the class, you know, you have to do all the assignments too. And so was to go with the, with the nurse on the team on a home visit to one of the patients that had been brought in for evaluation in the clinic. As it happened, the patient uh, that I went on this home visit to was uh, a Chinese gentleman. His family had just emigrated from recently from China, and I, I, what I was supposed to do is sort of uh, be on the home visit, observe what happened, but also I was supposed to write up a report from my own disciplinary perspective. And as it happens, my master's is in East Asian studies. My focus was in Japan, so I didn't speak. I speak Japanese, not any, not any of the Chinese languages, but if you get an interdisciplinary master's in East Asian studies, you'll learn a lot about Korean and Chinese culture too. So I knew about Chinese culture, and as an anthropologist, then I wrote up this report on all these cultural issues that I saw um, in with this patient. There were quite a number of them, and I did an analysis of the family dynamics. It was, as it turned out, a pretty traditional Chinese family. Uh, and you can see some of these traditional things. And so I wrote a cultural analysis of this and presented it to the class. And again, it was being in the right place at the right time. Okay, so they had just gotten this uh, National Institute on Aging grant to work with the Chinese population and, you know, to try to get um, families to bring uh, elders they're concerned about in for evaluations through the clinic. So they, you know, my postdoc was ending and they uh, saw me present on these cultural issues and they said, how would you like a job for the next three years? Um, they had hired um, a guy who was ethnic Chinese um, from Malaysia slash Singapore who was multilingual in multiple Chinese languages. So they already had him on board, but they felt uh, we could really use a medical anthropologist with knowledge of Chinese culture, which you've just demonstrated. And so we would like to hire you for the next three years. How does that sound? And it was like, wow. And so basically it was a job that it was a research project. It was also outreach. We were doing outreach, educational outreach to the Chinese community as well. And I was a, a, a medical anthropologist on the clinical diagnostic team. So that my Chinese colleague and I, we did the family interview as part of a, a multidisciplinary evaluation of patients coming through. And we would, we, we would, Keen, my Chinese colleague and I would interview the family and pick up, you know, the kinds of things that you normally get in a family interview, uh, financial resources, the, where they lived and so on. But also the added dimension that we would do a cultural screening for cultural issues involved that would be important in the diagnosis. And so I did that for the next three years, and there were about 25 um, Chinese patients that came through and their families, um, as well as I helped organize a conference uh, for care Chinese caregivers in Chinatown, and also another conference for ethnic Chinese uh, um, physicians to you know educate them more about Alzheimer's and dementia and diagnosing it. There were tons of cultural clashes that occurred, and the team tended to look at things that were different. Um, uh, there were a number of, I mean, not all, there's lots of cultural diversity among Chinese, but we certainly had some more traditional Chinese family coming through where if you, you need, if you knew Chinese culture, then you knew some of the aspects of family uh, or belief in gods, ghosts, and ancestors, you know, family roles and relationships that were more traditionally Chinese. And then we would have some families who weren't traditionally Chinese, but you had to be able to certainly know what you're seeing. And, and knowledge of Chinese culture helped. Um, and um, the team I worked with tend to think that biological diagnosis was, you know, it was, the culture wasn't involved in that. And they thought my colleague and I would be doing um, uh, referrals, culturally appropriate referrals. But as it turned out, and working with them over three years, they definitely got 
the message and saw it in action that actually culture comes right into the diagnosis because if you think of beliefs in gods, ghosts, and ancestors are as a, a f some a function of, of brain disease instead of traditional beliefs in the supernatural, then you're you're headed towards a misdiagnosis. So, um, and so there are many, or if you think that an elderly Chinese lady who bosses her good Chinese son around and expects to get respect for him is some kind of personality disorder or something, uh, you're wrong. <laughs> and this is, um, the, so we saw the team doing initially until they got used to working with us and then they really would look at me and Keen and say, okay, what's the cultural issues here? But at first they would see these traditional elements in Chinese uh, culture and they would, they would think maybe they have due to uh, possible dementia or personality uh, problems or dynamics in the family that were, were abnormal in some way. And it, we like know the very evidence that you are using to build up a case for some kind of pathology or, or you know, interpersonal dynamic that isn't okay as the very same evidence that points to this particular family being pretty traditionally Chinese, whereas that family isn't, but this one, yeah, that's pretty, you know, belief in gods, ghosts, and ancestors, um, believing that if you dream about, you know, that, that supernatural beings will communicate with you through dreams and you get up and you better get that, you know, get whatever the, the personage in the dream asked for. So there were, there were a lot of these issues that came up. Um, and so I was, and, and it was at that point actually in my trajectory, because I know one of the questions is when did you start s seeing yourself as a gerontologist? That was when I was working with that team, my business card I had, and we were supposed to get business cards, and I had um, uh, medical anthropologists and ethnogerontologist designated on that business card um, that I would give people as a member of the team. So I really started identifying myself as a kind of a gerontologist at that point. Um, and then uh, ultimately, um, I, when I went on to uh, apply for academic for teaching positions, I applied for um, uh, gerontology positions. And you know, and, and the number of gerontology positions are they want people more quantitatively or some of the traditional like the social work or psychology, sociology. Um, there were not all that many gerontology jobs available for a qualitative cultural anthropologist. But you know, I was that's what I, the direction I wanted to go in at that point. So uh, and I applied for those jobs that became available, and I got a job. Um, as uh, as a the uh, full time ger first full time gerontology faculty member at Minnesota State University Mankato, um, in oh, was it the fall of 1998, I went there, and so they and they were they were looking you know they're very broad minded so it was you didn't have to be quantitative and they thought it was really interesting that I was a uh, a cultural anthropologist and ethnogerontologist, and I certainly at that point had a track record. I'd done two postdocs in gerontology, and I had applied work, you know, with the Alzheimer's team in three years under my belt, and so on. So that um, that's I started off at uh, at uh, Minnesota State Mankato as a, as a full-time gerontology person. And the first seven years I was at MSU Mankato, I was. Uh, full-time gerontologist. Six of those years I was the director of the gerontology program there, um, which is, you know, interdisciplinary draws in a number of different departments. So I was clearly then very much had the credentials as a gerontologist, very much thought of myself as a gerontologist as well as a cultural anthropologist. Um, and then we reorganized. Um, in what was about 2005, we reorganized the gerontology program, which was sort of all by its lonesome. They had pulled it out of social uh, sociology, and then I was a one person floating out in space with the program, and so we reorganized it. And at that point, then I went full time into the anthropology department, and the gerontology program was embedded back into sociology. Uh, and that, but I continued on the gerontology program faculty committee. Now they've renamed the program, the Aging Studies program. Um, but and I, so I continue to sit on that committee. And now I teach mostly, almost all geronto all uh, anthropology classes. Before that, I was teaching gerontology classes, uh, including the anthropology of aging. And then after the reorganization, and ever since then, I've 
teach uh, all anthropology classes, uh, including the anthropology of aging <laughs> uh, class. So I still participate. And this fall, I, that was the most recent time I taught it. I had several gerontology students as well as anthropology students <coughs> in the class together. And for me, it was an interesting sort of transition because you, in, when you teach gerontology students, you're trying to teach them what culture is really like, that you know, it's not a checklist that creates a stereotype because that's, it's very hard not to, when in, in teaching the team at UC San Francisco, I was, you know, I created my own monsters occasionally that they would misunderstand, because with healthcare people, they use a lot of check, and you know, social checklists and checklists. And, and I had some colleagues at, at, um, in the medical anthro program at UC San Francisco that had a, a book of checklists of culture, but and, and I would, did point out to them later, well, it's kind of dangerous to hand a book like this to a group of healthcare professionals or service professionals because they're used to checklists. And, and you're creating a situation where very likely you're going to create stereotypes. <clears throat> and it's very hard not to do that. And I always try not to do it, but I, you know, when I taught people in the team traditional elements of Chinese culture, and you know, trying to get it in, it's, oh, it's normal to believe in gods, ghosts, and ancestors if, if you're you know, part of that traditional Chinese belief. Not all Chinese do, but this lady clearly does, and these are ancient beliefs and so on. And trying to get them, and yes, older people, you know, particularly elderly women in traditional Chinese families become very powerful, and they throw their way around. And as my Chinese colleague said, and if you challenge them on their power, they'll assert it even more, and we saw some of that. So, you know, I was trying to get them used, and then, uh, and then I remember the, a non-traditional Chinese family came through. And the head of our team, a geriatrician, a PhD, MD geriatrician, looked very proudly at me and once said, well, as we all know, Chinese families, X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, oh my god, I just created a stereotype. But now I have to punch down. But I had created it myself because it's very hard to do this kind of training and get people to, to see you know, features of a culture without, you know, if they haven't been trained, in what culture is from a more anthropological perspective that it's flexible and multifaceted and always changing and so on, then you do this. Um, I ended up basically saying to the team, look, if you take knowledge about that, say, Chinese culture, certain features of Chinese culture, you should use it the way you use that, say, your knowledge of neurology. You're working, when you're dealing with a particular patient, you're not taking all everything you know about neurology and, and you know projecting it onto the patient. You're saying what is or is not true of this patient based on my knowledge of neurology. And this is what I want you to do with cultural knowledge of Chinese. Don't go in assuming this is a traditional or non-traditional family. Um, be aware of features of Chinese culture, traditional and the, the, the changes that are happening in Chinese societies you know, all over the world. And then you know, see what is or is not true of this particular patient. And also for service providers who are trying to go and provide services in a, in a Chinatown somewhere, don't assume all Chinatowns are the same. They're not. Work for the generalized body of knowledge. What is true of San Francisco's Chinatown? or New York City's Chinatown, and what is not true. And, and I found that was very effective because it built on what they were already doing with their knowledge in terms of applying it to particular clients and, and patients and so on. Um, so that um, I had basically quite a lot of adventures in, in, in trying to get the flexibility, the complexity of culture across to people who are not trained anthropologists. So I was doing that when I was teaching the first seven years at MSU, teaching a gerontology students trying to about culture, as well as I was teaching an interdisciplinary introduction to gerontology as well, and doing and rural aging and those kinds of things. But I always tried to put a lot of, you know, culture into it as well. Um, then when I switched over to anthropology, I was still getting gero students but I was also getting anthropology students, and it was sort of, they didn't have the problem with, you know, understanding culture in a more complex way. But the challenge there was to get them to, to realize that this population and populations all over the world are aging, and that they will grow old, 
and that the people they love will grow old and the people all around them in their communities will grow old and we're all part of this whether they they had any intention of going on to gerontology or not. Um, and so it was kind of interesting and, and I, I remember writing a piece uh, for um, the newsletter of uh, the Association for Anthropology and Gerontology of like moving from one side of you know aging to the other in terms of now you know trying to get the anthropology students more aware of these things and I've been successful in that um, I had uh, two archaeology grad students in my anthropology of aging last fall and I actually got them thinking about they're both from uh, grew up on farms and they in, in, expect to inherit the farms and they'll be digging probably excavating things on their farms as well but they actually were very enthusiastic about it and in terms of oh yeah there our community our, our the rural communities we're from are aging because people are moving out and our families are aging so they really got on board along with the other anthro students I had and then of course I had several Gero students as well so it was interesting to s I tried to get them to talk to each other in discussions and exchange their own perspectives but I you know to get two archaeology grad students who usually are picking away at things in the arc lab to be excited about you know and, and really interested in the aging of the world all around them I think was uh, was very satisfying for me so now it's sort of the trajectory has been kind of interesting and in sort of anthropology into gerontology and back into anthropology and the two have been woven together really since I was a teenager um, you know in that because that's when I first started getting interest in anthropology and I had that interest in in older people before that and so it's always been sort of shifting back and forth but interweaving it. I'm going to shift a little bit into um, talking about mentorship and asking you if you had female mentors who impacted this trajectory you've talked so wonderfully about. Yes, I, I, but my, my mentors uh, were all uh, women and they were uh, female anthropologists who were in the anthropology of aging. They were significant in the anthropology of aging. Um, and of course one of the Dina Shank, I met her very, um, the first time I went to, to um, GSA um, was, I guess it was in 1991. And I met Dina, and uh, I met uh, Marjorie uh, Schweitzer, who was an anthropologist. She does uh, ha ha edited a book on American Indian grandmothers, and, and Maria Cattell, who had worked in, in, I believe it's Kenya, and as well, she she worked with the Philadelphia Geriatric Center as well for on a project there. So those three, Maria and uh, Cattell, and Marjorie Schweitzer, and Dina Shank, were I met them all there. Um, at that GSA, at the uh, Association for Gerontology and uh, uh, Anthropology and Gerontology, used to uh, have their. We used to sell T-shirts and stuff at GSA, and so I volunteered. I was already a member, and that, and I volunteered to help out, and was selling T-shirts with the three of them, and and it was a place where. We all, you know, people hung out, the Gero people, uh, the anthropology people hung out when they went to GSA. And so I was doing that regularly and I got to know the three of them really well and they were really modeling how an anthropologist, an anthropology of aging person could also be involved in the Gerontological Society of America, that you could go to both gerontology and anthropology conferences. Because then I would see them at the American, uh, you know, Anthropological Association where we also were selling t-shirts and we, you know, trying to get anthropologists, again, moving to the other side there, trying to get the anthropologists to realize that, you know, the world is aging. Um, so we, it was, it, they three modeled how you could really combine anthropology and gerontology and be active in, you know, in uh, professional organizations that are both anthropological and gerontological. And so they were both, I would say, the three very important people. Me. What is unique to being a woman gerontologist? That was, it was sort of, yeah, I mean, when I, I saw that, uh, looked at the question before, and I'm trying to think that, I, I guess, the, the most sort of unique and interesting thing for me in terms of coming into gerontology um, was not so much the, the being female, but it was being an anthropologist. Um, although certainly Maria and, and Dina and Marjorie certainly modeled the sort of being a female professional who was, you know, combining, they're all combining anthropology and gerontology. 
Um, but it was more the thing that sticks out in my mind is the anthropologist becoming more involved in gerontology and getting this sort of track record um, that because gerontology is, you know, you have the social work, psychology, and sociology, more quantitative fields and quantitative approaches. And then, of course, public health and so on, very quantitative kinds of orientations. And we would have, you know, adventures with quantitative people in the early days, and, you know, because I've been involved in this obviously since the early 90s, going to both conferences and stuff. Um, and, you know, the quantitative people who were not on board yet with accepting qualitative as anything more than anecdotal. And you'd, you'd be on the escalator, and <laughs> so you'd hear people in front of you saying, well, I, I don't know what they're, you know, there's a, I don't know qualitative approaches. And it wasn't just anthropology, but just sort of these humanities, what are people, what are they doing here? And so on. And now, I think that's very much improved in gerontology that there's much more of a track record of qualitative, you know, work in anthropology and otherwise, and people are, are more open to it. Um, one of my favorite people, actually, in um, anthropology of aging is, uh, is not a woman, uh, um, Bob Rubenstein. Right, you know Bob, <laughs> and so you probably heard this before. But Bob, I remember when I was at UC, at University of Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor as a postdoc, we invited uh, Bob Rubenstein because they were saying, "Oh, who should we invite?" And and I, I said, "Bob, invite Bob." And so Bob came, and he gave a talk and stuff. And I remember I was chatting with him afterwards, and he was talking about, it, you know, it's, well, you know those quantoids. Right. You've heard that term. So, you know those quantoids, and in, in, uh, and and he says, I say that affectionately. But again, we talked about these, you know, qu the quantoids who couldn't quite, you know, w grapple with or truly accept the qualitative people and the qual, you know, this qualitative dimension to the study of aging. And and we used to talk about that at conferences. And I think that's very much improved since then. So I guess it was more like being an anthropologist. And, and a qualitative type, you know, trying to deal with and communicate with the quantoids and get them to realize we had something to say too. And in the years that I've been active in, in the anthropology of aging and in gerontology, it's been very gratifying that after a certain period of time, some publications that anthropologists had put out won uh, awards from GSA, innovative approaches in gerontology. And we used to think that was so <laughs> we, we, we like because these are classic tech qualitative ethnographic techniques in anthropology. There's nothing new about them, but it was new to gerontology. So we used to th we used to think be amused by that, but at the same time we were really happy because it was clear we were making inroads. Everybody in anthropology making was very. Have, like what we're being our, our publications that people are putting out are being recognized as new and innovative and a, and a significant contribution by the gerontological society of america so you know and we know that the, the people who have been acting, like bob and like dina and so on who have been very active in both uh, over the years have and jay sokolowski of course and so on that have really um, you know, open doors for qualitative uh, anthropology types, whether they're anthropologists or not, but also just sort of this qualitative, uh, you know, kind of uh, contributions that, that we can make, all of us who come from fields that are not heavily quantitative um, can make. And so the quantoids actually began to recognize us and talk to us and maybe even work with us, which is, was just great. And in the meantime, we used to joke, we used to talk about that. We had this great t-shirt um, for the Association for Anthropology and Gerontology that had a bar graph on it and was broken down by age and sex. And it was very interesting that the gerontologists always got that. So there'd be the quantoid part actually helped with their, because they would look at that and they'd laugh. I even brought a couple of t-shirts back from my, uh, a sociology colleague of mine at MSU and her husband because he thought it was absolutely hilarious. Whereas it didn't always, you know, connect completely at the American Anthropological Association meetings unless the anthropologist happened to be, you know, because some of them are, you know, they, they're training quantitative methods. But a lot of the quality of anthropologists go, oh, that's interesting, and they didn't get the bar graph. And so it was sort of gratifying that the quantoids would actually, as they began to be more open to anthropology, they thought that was a t-shirt, and then they'd stop by 
our, and they'd see the T-shirt and they'd want to buy them. We, we sold a lot of them at the, uh, at, you know, right before around Thanksgiving at GSA. People were buying them for, you know, spouses for Christmas and things like that. So it helped our sales too. But it was like they got the punchline. So you know, and the more qualitative people didn't quite get the punchline. So it's kind of been interesting to sort of. Been, I mean, my work is qualitative, but it's sort of to also to talk with the quantoids and to talk and to be use some of the qual, you know, the, the quantitative, you know, research and teaching in gerontology classes or anthropology classes, and sort of it's been interesting to be be sort of betwixt and between, you know, be, and at you know, that the place where anthropology and gerontology meet, the place where qualitative and quantitative approaches meet. I've always found that to be really interesting and. My advisor when I was in grad school, my, my dissertation was a medical anthropologist and a practicing psychiatrist. And he used to talk about how, you know, uh, you know, he was sort of balancing medical anthropology and psychiatry and he used to write about and talk about it's at the margins, at these meeting places, of uh, these overlaps and these interesting meeting places between disciplines and approaches which he thought were the most fascinating. To explore, and I have to say that you know certainly over my career, you know, combining anthro anthropology and gerontology, and being aware of quantitative uh, techniques uh, as well as using qualitative techniques myself, I also feel that way. It's it's working with you know talking to the quantoids is actually very interesting. If they'll talk back with you, and if they'll have conversations with you, it's actually really interesting. So I've been really very happy whether I'm in teaching in gerontology program or in anthropology. I'm still just as much an anthropologist or just as much a gerontologist, and the two combined all along. And I find that very interesting. And I find it too in my other special major specialty, medical anthropology, because you know you're sort of there. Are, but there's the biology, there's the culture, there's the, especially working with that team at UCF San Francisco, there's the anthropology in com combination with health sciences and people from you know different kinds of health science perspectives. I always found that really interesting and to observe. I remember when I was at UC San Francisco working with a team, we had a medical anthropology graduate student who sat in on one of our sessions. Um, and uh, the geriatrician, who was the head of the team, was was uh, introdu introducing her to the rest of the team. This is why she's observing and everything and so on, and, and made some kind of a comment about that you know uh, that what I was you know we were studying the Chinese end of it and not the uh, and the team itself wasn't being studied and stuff. And then I remember leaning over to her and whispering, "Well, that's what she thinks because actually I was studying the team." just as much as I was studying what happened with the Chinese and that collision between cultures. And I used to say to the team, um, the best way you have to differentially diagnose between what I unscientifically called the, uh, the normal bizarre, like it, it may be bizarre to you, but it's culturally normal for them. And, what, and the bizarre, quote unquote, that might actually be due to some kind of brain dysfunction. So, but I was studying them just as much as, as the Chinese patients who are coming in and what their cultural issues are. How, if and, and how being a gerontologist has intersected with your personal aging process? I, yeah, I think that I'm just not, um, you know, I'm not afraid of aging per se. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I think it's very natural that you grow old and maybe that's part a continuation of also the close relationship with my grandfather as well. It's natural and it's normal to grow old and ultimately to die. None of us are getting out of this alive. And so, you know, it's natural, it's normal. Um, and I, you know, you're just following this life course. And I think too, in terms of cross-cultural studies of of uh, the life course, I can look at my own life and sort of sort of look back and, and think about what you know who I was at a much younger age, which is something that I got when I certainly a perspective I got when I did my dissertation in, uh, research in Denmark. I was looking at the perspective of elders themselves um, ultimately and and how that that clashed with what they they thought was the social welfare state view of them. 
um, and they would they said to me explicitly, you know, when you were an anthropologist, you go into the field with certain questions, and and the sort of the uh, the wisdom is that you once you get used to the environment and do a lot of qualitative exploratory interviewing, then you find out maybe those aren't the questions to ask. Maybe there are more important issues and questions to ask. And so I went in with the ideas about how older people were taken care of by what the welfare state role as opposed to that say what it used to be in Japan. And what I found out was that this major disjunction from the point of view of elders that it interviewed between their own view of themselves, which was vertical, looking you know over their own life course and seeing themselves in the context of that, what they were when they were 20 or 50 or whatever, or uh, a 95-year-old woman who said, you know, I'm not the same person I was when I was 75. I, you need to understand that, you know. And this is this kind of view of oneself. And they would explicitly, a lot of my informants explicitly said you know, the welfare state does not view us the way we view ourselves. They think this is because we have gray hair and wrinkles and a number of common health problems and maybe other financial problems. They think that we're all alike and we're all so incredibly different from each other. And that's, and, and we just don't, you know, and they, it's, it, they felt basically that the more they got pulled into long-term care kinds of institutions, the more their view of themselves and who they were, um, who they were becoming, who they had been, was really beginning to clash with a, this idea about the, what a pensioner was you know, what a pensioner's needs are and in terms of everything from long-term care to health to whatever. And they said they just didn't, you know, that was something that was very painful for them. So my dissertation really focused on that, this, that disjuncture of different, very different views within that society and that culture of elders being really generated in different ways, you know. And so I've sort of often thought back on that in terms of I, uh, myself getting older, in terms of how I see myself as the way my, my Danish uh, elderly informants talk about themselves, looking back over my life course and so on and how I keep changing. And, and again, it's sort of, it's not, it's something natural and normal when you get older. And yes, there are sort of, you know, uh, my knees are a little rickety, more rickety than they used to be because I, walk a lot and stuff and and uh, yeah your body changes as you get older but you know and that's just a, those things happen and uh, obviously you you know you don't want to be dep uh, you want to still be able to walk and you worry about issues of health issues and stuff like that I suppose I don't right now but I you know you look at forward as the years to come yeah and you hope you'll stay as healthy as you can and as functional as you can because as a gerontologist you're aware of you know certain declines in body function or r disease risks and things like that but those are but I you know obviously as a gerontologist I know those are separate from you know uh, healthy functional aging so I don't have the kinds of fears that some of my friends have, you know, that aren't gerontologists. They're like, don't you wish you were younger? I'm terrified of getting older. And someone said that to me last Friday night when I was at this fundraising event in, in town for a nonprofit. And a friend of mine um, said, she, you know, oh, I'm getting older. I'm really getting scared. Aren't you scared? Don't you wish you were much younger? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no, actually, I don't. <laughs> And she couldn't quite understand that. So I think just gerant being involved in gerontology, as well as having an excellent model of a grandfather that I grew up with who was very healthy and active until he was quite old, um, have, you know, maybe that just predisposed, made me, I wasn't afraid to go into gerontology because I had a different view of what aging could be from my grandfather in such a positive view. And then all, everything since then has reinforced that. Despite the things we study as gerontologists that, you know, health issues and housing issues and financial issues and so on. But that doesn't, you know, I mean, you, you also understand the positives and the gains and how much healthier people are living like later into their, their lives than ever before. And as an anthropologist, when I talk about this to anthropology of aging students, that, you know, our species is, you know, for the first time ever in the history of our species, 
you know, more people are living longer and healthier lives than ever before in all the, you know, since the Homo sapiens first evolved. And that's, that's a really positive and good thing. So looking at the negatives and only focusing on them is just a total distortion um, given, you know, all the good news. Our Wiggle Project is focusing on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Mm -hmm. And so within that framework, uh, we would like to close by asking if there's anything else you think is really important to know about the legacies of women gerontologists. Let's see what I don't know. Um, uh, well, I, I think that older women gerontologists have added what, you know, a lot of women have added to many disciplines in terms of really uh, uh, getting a much uh, uh, better rounded picture, uh, certainly of human aging. Uh, and bringing in the female perspective or looking at, as Marjorie Schweitzer, uh, you know, has done, looking at American Indian grandmothers, what's the role, and that's a very, very important role of grandmothers in many Native American communities. Um, and, you know, looking at, you know, uh, aspects of, um, of aging that from, let's say, a female perspective um, uh, certainly has, added information um, to, you know, to understanding of these things, as in we know in anthropology too, that once female anthropologists started studying certain cultures that had been looked at only from the male point of view, earlier entire doors, <laughs> you know, open up. Um, and so I, there's a, um, an anthropologist um, who uh, looked at aging from, or the aging in the, fa or women in the family uh, from a female, basically in, Ch in Taiwan, um, from the female point of view. And she went in with her husband, um, initially as a wife to help him study in a Taiwanese village. Uh, and she, you know, he was looking at it from the male point of view, patrilineal and, you know, families built on, on, on men and so on. And she identified, and she said, well, the women in the family have a, have a different idea. They marry into their husband's pat patriline, they hopefully have sons, then they'll have daughters-in-law, and they create this unit, which she called, um, her name was Marjorie Wolf, and, and she called the uterine family was really important to ch elderly Chinese women or women in general as they move in that, you know, traditionally the lowest in seniority in, in a in society ranked by age and gender. Once they have that son, they build the power and they have a daughter-in-law and there'll be a mother-in-law. And that this was the part of the kinship of the family that was important to these women in this village in rural Taiwan, not the entire patriarchy line and in the ancestral hall and all these things the men were concerned about. And because Marjorie Wolf and others like her, because other female anthropologists have, had done this kind of thing too, it's then you look, well, you know, what is Chinese kinship? And from whose point of view? And it, it can be very differently invested in and seen, um, you know, according to gender. And I think that um, women in gerontology have also brought that kind of perspective. And so what is aging from a female point of view? Uh, what's a female perspective on this and how does it relate to female roles, uh, expectations of women uh, in, that they have, that the society has as a whole, or what kinds of roles are open to women in old age that may not be open to men or vice versa and so on. So I think that the legacy of older women gerontologists who have been, you know, a, a number of them really pioneering this just as female anthropologists who've been pioneering looking at, you know, a different the culture, certain aspects from a different perspective, it gives a much fuller picture of the phenomena, in this case, uh, human aging. And so I think that's really what the legacy uh, has been, and also just opening those doors so that now many more women are coming into gerontology and continuing to do more research and to, I think, have a, a, a balance with the men you know, who are in gerontology who are now much more used to um, acknowledging that, you know, the world 
that women exist and that there are different roles, different perspectives and so on, and that that's all part of the picture and obviously related to what happens with men as they grow old and what happens with men and families or, or you know, other kinds of concerns or health. You know, how you know, men's health and women's health differ or how they're in interconnected and so on. So that having that, I know that in medical anthropology when I teach about um, gender and health, they're all, you know, they're sort of, oh yeah, gender roles. It's not just whatever physiological differences and so on, they're male and female, but there are culturally created differences in health risks, health status. And so on, um, and uh, clearly, as you know, in my metaanthro class, I bring in the aging and health dimension as well, and that has ramifications for males and females as they grow old in different cultures. In terms of what are some of the risks, what are some of the the, the socio-cultural embeddings of, of certain types of health issues or uh, protection against certain types of injuries or illnesses or uh, risks that, you know, uh, and that certainly is bound, because men in certain cultures are a greater risk for certain things than women and vice versa. You know, so that, that's where a lot of stuff I've done in medical anthropology also then interweaves with, you know, uh, aging as well and, you know, and different gender issues and so on. So it, it's just a more complete picture than it used to be. I mean, when, and when you think about that it took what, uh, some of these longitudinal studies on health and aging, it took them until what, the, the 1970s to decide that maybe we should add women to the sample because like, you know, the generic person is not a man. I mean, there are this, <laughs> that these health issues do play out differently among men and women and that is kind of stunning when you think it took until the 1970s for researchers to so, and that's not so long ago. I mean, at, not, at least not for me, because I remember the 1970s. <laughs> but, you know, and, and you think, oh, back a couple of decades, things have really, you know, changed since then. And women entering into fields like gerontology or anthropology have made a big difference there in getting a much fuller and more sophisticated point of view on these issues. So I think that's an important legacy that continues and I think younger women, and I know myself just the, what Maria Cattell uh, and um, the Marjorie Schweitzer who are you know a bit older than I am and, and Dina's not that much older than I am but Dina was still, I think she was old, it's Dina. And you know so the opening those doors and, and helping me out and I'm hoping the things that I've done and other women in my cohort have done have helped the women coming up now. So that's what I would say about the, the legacy.